Hey everybody, welcome to Always Bored, Never Boring. My postman has just delivered issue 467 of White Dwarf Magazine, so as always, I'm going to take a quick look at it. And for those of you who are not subscribers to the channel, I'm going to say this up front, I don't go through White Dwarf Magazines in detail looking at every single article, and my focus is always on the board games, and in particular Warhammer Quest. So if your main interest is, for example, the Flashpoint articles or the Four Warlords articles, I'm not going to go into those here. There are plenty of other channels that will cover all of that sort of stuff. With that out of the way, before I dive in, I will mention briefly that, as you might expect, this particular issue of the magazine focuses very heavily on Age of Sigmar because we have just had the launch of the new edition of Age of Sigmar with the Dominion box set and all of the starter sets, which feature Stormcast Eternals and Cruel Boys Oryx. So there's lots of that in this particular issue, plus articles on the Sons of Behemoth. And because of that focus, if we flick to the centre pages, if we flick to the part where there is a card insert, it's probably not that surprising to see that they have included a quick reference for the new version of Age of Sigmar. That's pretty handy for those people who play and probably a good use of that particular insert. I said in previous issues that I thought sometimes that the use of the card insert was not particularly what I would have expected or what I would consider the best use for it, but this seems like a good idea. Beyond that, there are all of the regular features. There is a new Flashpoint Octarius article, the standard Glory Points article for Diachasm, painting guides, and if there is anything in particular you would like to know about this issue that I'm not talking about in the video, do feel free to leave questions in the comments below and I will do my best to answer them for you. But this is the article that is of particular interest to me. It is the building of the city of Ulfenkarn. This is a four page article looking at the artwork of the tiles that came with Warhammer Quest Cursed City. And I was surprised to see this article at all. When I reviewed last month's White Dwarf magazine, I said it felt like they had covered all aspects of Cursed City that they really could. There wasn't really a lot left for them to talk about, and it felt like the sign-off at the end of that last article was more of a sign-off for the series as a whole rather than that one particular article. And yet here we are again, and this article really does feel like filler. It is a puff piece. It is the puffiest of puff pieces, really. It's so puffy, you might think White Dwarf Magazine was having an allergic reaction to content. Whereas previous articles at least had some kind of strategy element to it. It talked about how to compose your parties, what items worked well with different characters. You don't really get any of that here. It's more just a chat about the thought process that went into creating the different artwork. But that is not to say there is nothing interesting in this article at all. There are a few things that stood out to me as being of note. First of all, numerous times in this article, they refer to Ulfenkarn by its old name of Mournhold. Now, I have seen numerous people online saying that the reason that Cursed City got shelved like it did was because of an IP dispute, and a number of people have pointed to the fact that Mournhold is the name of a city in the Elder Scrolls, and that is why Games Workshop had to bury Cursed City the way they did. I think the inclusion of several references to Mournhold in this article would suggest that that theory can be debunked at this point. I don't care how far advanced you are writing your articles or publishing your magazine, if there is some kind of legal dispute that you are dealing with relating to the use of a particular term, you would make sure that term was not published in your international magazine. Moving on, there is a small box out regarding the mysterious objects. And it talks about how the people of Ulfenkarn would hide their treasures and then guard them with family familiars. And this was quite nice because it explained something about the mysterious objects. The raven with the key in its mouth and the skeleton pointing. These are actually guardians placed by the families. And with the demise of the families at the hands of Radukar the wolf, the animated remains of their ancestors or the family familiars, these ravens, are actually doing their part to fight back. They are aiding the rebellion. The skeletons hanging from the nooses are pointing the heroes in the right direction, telling them where their families hid objects of power. The ravens are the family familiars, pointing out to the heroes, here's a key to a casket that may help you defeat Radukar. And that's pretty interesting and not something that I really picked up on from the miniatures themselves. 
The next thing is, I mean, it's pretty obvious really. There are no blocked tiles on any of the boards in Cursed City. Every board is completely open. There's no blocking terrain of any kind. And there's just a little mention of that in this article saying that that was very much a conscious decision. They didn't want any blocking terrain on any tiles. They wanted movement to be completely free and open. I wish they had talked a little bit more about why they made that particular design choice, but it was very much a conscious decision. And finally, the last thing that I think is noteworthy is that numerous rooms in the set draw inspiration from the various mortal realms, the realms that are in turn named after the Winds of Magic. So when they designed the graveyard tile, that is the Shaish tile. There is a menagerie tile where all of the cages have been burst open, and that particular tile is a reference to the realm of Gur. And then there is a smithy which relates to Akshi and an alchemy lab for Chamon. And again, that's a fun little detail about the boards that I hadn't really picked up on myself. And I do quite like to get those little glimpses into the thought processes that went on behind the scenes, what the designers were thinking. But really, that's about it. It's a four page article. It really is quite lightweight. There were those few snippets of information that I thought were interesting, but that is pretty much everything there is to say about it, except for the fact that Games Workshop are clearly feeling bold. Because down here, at the bottom of the article, it says if you have any questions or have any other feedback, on Warhammer Quest Cursed City, you can email your questions and comments to warhammerquest at gwplc.com. That's a bold move, Games Workshop. That's a bold move. Other than that, in this issue, we do have a new narrative campaign, Lair of the Archaeotech for Necromunda. That's going to be of interest to the Necromunda players. But really, I don't have anything else to say about this particular issue. It was interesting to see another Warhammer Quest Cursed City article. Will we see another one next month? Who knows? At this point, I'm not even going to hazard a guess anymore. As I mentioned before, if you have any questions or anything you would like to say, do feel free to leave them in the comments below because that is it from me for now. Thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, please consider pressing the like button. If you really enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing if you don't already do so. And hopefully, I'll see you all again very soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.